to my channel and welcome to yet another fanfiction reading. So for this, we're gonna be reading Sax slash Zoro's um poet, which is in arc number two, chapter twenty-five. And this one's obviously like the whole fanfiction is contains profanity, and this and the fanfiction also contains graphic violence. So. What I'm gonna do is like the previous BFS fanfics I wrote. I mean, read. I didn't write them. I only like wrote most of it. Um, if I come across profanity, which I hope I don't, like for the most part, I'm gonna insert a random clip from Theodore Tugboat. So I quickly look at um how long it is, and this is actually not that long. But I'm not sure like how much violence or profanity there is. I hope there isn't like too much of it because for the past two chapters I wrote there wasn't like much of it. Especially in like Lizzie's chapter where there wasn't much like profanity or so. Maybe like at the end of the chapter there was like, you know, a violent scene and I only considered like one But I think Care Cups was a bit severe, maybe it's slightly edgy. And this slightly Marie Sue, like holy crap, please tone it down. And I'm hoping this one won't be as that bad. And I'm just like crossing my fingers that it won't be good, so. Well, considering how probably the best uh, strategy between us four, as well as her supporting role within the team herself, I guess that's why Quotation Regent, as a nickname caught on for Zach said, taking a swig of his drink. What kind of drink? Is he drinking orange juice, soda, ginger ale? Water? Who knows? Staying across him, taking dark pot shots around the room with his eyes, was Slicer. The bar they were currently reciting at out was near the edge of the town. Oh, okay, so they are in a bar. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. I should have not jumped into conclusions. Okay! Um, they were currently reciting at. Oh, sorry. In its location, combined with the sun accepted departure between the horizon, meaning that there were few others to be found. Noticing Sasha's ap apprehension, Zack simply said, ah, Don't worry about your mission, our target will be there. He was left shortly. He paused, just finishing his drink. As a matter of fact, he should be entering just about now. Right on cue, lanky man. A lanky? Oh, oh, a tall lanky man in the grey suit strolled briskly into the view. He carried a glossy black briefcase with him, which he placed carefully onto the board. There's our guy, Zack said, without even turning to look at the man. He runs an arm smuggling operation around him with a few local gains. It's one way to make money, I suppose. Unfortunately, our business consists of ending his business. Well, what do we what are what are we to do then? Slice to ask. Just stick close to me and act tough and all the rest. Sounds like a very confusing yet big plan, but we'll see how that figures out. Getting up on his seek seek seat. Zack approached the man, and shedding a purple and black dog dark dark and dark I can't, I can't read today, I'm sorry. Uh, just whatever can katana etched with snake designs uh, along the blade. For some reason I've seen that design before, I just can't recall. So, here's the deal, Zack said non nonchalantly. The man in the suit was still facing his back towards him, but Zack knew for a fact that he had his attention, so if a fight broke out in the bar, that's gonna be bad news? I mean, what did that guy, the grey suit man do, is my question. <laughs> Either you hand over, hand yourself over so we can turn you in, or we'll turn you in ourselves, piece by tiny piece. Three whole seconds tick by. With a sudden, desperate movement, the man grabbed hold of his briefcase and took the swing in an attempt to wound Zack. Rebecca, the research vessel, blew her horn. 
before he could even finish his initial swing, Zack's arm lashed out a snake struck. Oh God! <laughs> Promptly suffering the man's hand. We are brave, shouted Hank, and he blew up some smoke just like George. Catching the briefcase in his other hand, he slammed it down upon the man's skull with the force of a sledgehammer. Preparing to attack! Damn! Slicer so commented, taking a glance at the blood that's now covering the briefcase. Wasn't that a bit eh? Get down! In an instant, Slicer was tackled to the ground. The next instant, he found himself behind the bar, his ears assaulted uh, by a percussive war of a torrent of gunfire. Of course, that sword had reinforcements, Zack muttered as he pulled himself off of Slicer. Slicer, still a bit winded from his unexpected teleportation, nor does the predicament they were in. Judging from the gunfire, there were probably at least a dozen gunmen swarming turning the bar to Swiss cheese. Any ideas for getting past these guys? I mean, Zack said, picking up his katana. We could just kill them. Real helpful. Real helpful. Yeah, yeah that's good. I agree. I'm sorry. It's, it's really helpful. Slicer replied, rolling his eyes as he too summoned his sword and prepared for battle. Taking off before Slicer even realized it, Zack darted to the nearest wall, deftly running up at the laundry. Holding his sword ready, he sprung off and towards one of the gun to the goons that had attempted to ambush him, decapitating him in an effortless stroke. They were so worried about being late, they bumped right into each other. Um, Hank, said Theodore. There goes nothing then, Slicer said. Charging a blade drill and vaulting over the bar. The sword was a comet, leaving a glowing blue conic trail that vaporized any bullets that dared try assault him. Darting to target, darting from target to target, the two of them were artists of death. Their brushes were blades, and their aim to paint a crimson college a collage before long, their masterpiece was complete. You know, Sesa said as they exited the bar. Oh, a little spoon. Uh, they. There's a Y missing. You do actually have to go to back up your wood. Where did you learn that? Zach turned to look at Slicer. Well, since we have a ways to go, I guess I'll indulge you in that story, if you wish. The rough concrete came unceremoniously against Zach's head as the men hauled into a cell. Even as I locked the cell door, he still lay there defeated. If I hit my head against the ground a few more times, maybe I'll solve the pain, since I'll be hurting less than a couple of when I'm done. <laughs> even though he was even though he knew he was simply musing to himself musing to himself, his muscles refused to bust, laying on the floor as uncomfortable as it was, it was still easier than sitting up. Zack had no idea who these strange men were or why they had taken him. But right now, he simply didn't have the energy to care. He figured out he'd probably just die. I didn't sleep his hunger. But his place was cut short by a muffled yet still audible sound of sniffling. I have allergies going on. Looking towards the source, he spotted a young boy, boy about his age, wearing a ragged set of clothes that seemed as if they were about to come out if he breathed them on them. Blah! If he played, breathed on them too hard. His skin was stained with blood, and the crisscross that teased the wounds cut covers his back and chest. Most noticeably of all was the presence of a multitude of bruises in tree like patterns across along his entire body. Zack was about to ask him if he was alright, but it didn't take a genius to figure out that he was he clearly was not. That's me all the time. Like, if I see someone hurt, I'm like, I go right? Like, severely hurt, and then they're like, oh my god, are you serious? No, I am not. I'm like one of those, like, people who state the obvious. Unsure of what to say, he tried some small talk. Um, hello? Zach said as he approached the boy. He scrunched his nose slightly. A wave of nausea hit him as the sight of wounds on the overwhelming sand. Sangry, ah, I can't even. Yeah, odor of blood flooded his mind with shock, horror, and disgust. 
The boy paused to sniffling. Look up, boys, into Zack's eyes. He still was blank, containing neither fear nor joy, nor any emotion. What's her name? Second pass, and the boy made no motion. The only sign of life he gave was a raspy, labored breathing, like an old man on his deathbed. Opening his mouth like a hinge of a rusty trap door, he spoke. His voice dried and reads like from a lack of use. Take What? The, oh, what? Even? Is that? Okay, I'm just thinking to like the previous chapter. I think now there's a connection also. A lot of people will jump to the conclusion that the dragon's blood is some heartless crime syndic syndicate. And while I do admit that a lot of what they did was truly cruel, you must take into account of an inherent fact of human nature. No one does anything without a due reason. Not to mention that although they did turn ch children into hitmen, they also treated him well. Treated them well. Gave them a home they otherwise that hell. They gave Jacob a prosthetic arm, his Orinthian pulsar sniper rifle, as well as teaching him how to fight. Even despite all his limitations, they gave me my robes, my blades, the fangs of sorrow, a rare Dorkengian quarterband. Though I can't say I owed him anything after the initial treatment of Jacob and I, I can say that all debts have been paid. Jacob, however, he's been caught up his moral compass. He's got his eyes on the north point so much that he doesn't realize he's walking right off the cliff. Is it bad to say, like, I'm a little bit torn on the backstory because it was slightly Mary Sue and, like, it was a bit too depressing? Although, I yes, I did expect this fanfiction to be, like, depressing or, like, lots of death or, like, no hope at all. I think this one took on a new level, if I'm not mistaken. Jet Zack sighed, looking slicer into the eyes. You've probably grown up on the whole good guy thing, haven't you? Well, let me tell you something. If there's anything I learned during all the years I've been alive, it's the real world. No one cares if you're good or evil. No one cares that you feel good for being such a saint. In Meridian, none of the warlords care if you're good or evil. They, ra they raid you and take everything you have all the same. My race, do what's practical. You can't be a hero if your idealism gets you killed. Well, what's the wisdom at the end of this chapter? It was short. I like how it's short, it's not like extensive. I think Jacob's was the most extensive. Although, I wouldn't jump to the conclusion that his is the extensive because I haven't even read Baizu's yet and I haven't like seen how long it is. But the next video, I will like read Baizu's part. So, um, this was actually a lot than I expected. I thought that I expected like some violent scenes or profanity but it was more of like oh my gosh what the heck is happening <laughs> which i am um, sort of pleased sort of not pleased i want to say like it's perfect in a way i'm not sure what's perfect about it. like i i don't know to be honest but i don't want to like talk too much about this like section but um i guess thank you guys for watching and i will see you guys in the next video